the most difficult and the most intricate and the most detailed is the decorative waterfowl carving. And that is what I seem to enjoy the most. A lot of what I'm going to tell you tonight can be used whether you're carving a dog or whatever. You know, it, you can, you'll have to kind of interpolate some of the things that I do, but at least you'll see how I, tr how I strive to get um, exactly the right poses and anatomies and sizes and so on and so forth. And a lot of novices just don't understand that. So I'm not pre presuming that you're all in a novice category by any means. But I hope that some of the tips that I give you uh, can be useful. Um, this is one of my latest birds that I completed. This is a drake uh, bufflehead. And rarely do I get a carving done that I'm totally satisfied with. Um, usually I always say, boy, I could have done that better or this better. Maybe one out of every 10, I'll say, pretty happy with that one. This was one I was pretty happy with. And one of the reasons is because on a live drake bufflehead, they have a rainbow type iridescence going through their head from dark through the brights down to the back. And you can see it on this working decoy better because I overpainted it. You see the differences in the, in the colors. But in the live bird, it's much more subtle and much more refined and much more like this. And uh, if you come up and look at it later on, you'll see that um, I didn't gob it up with a lot of extra paint and it came out pretty nice. Right now I'm working on the uh, white-fronted goose, also known as a speckle belly. This is what we call a working decoy. This is, or I call them wham-bams, you know. You get one of, the, I make one of these complete painted and everything else in less than 40 hours. Um, its counterpart in a decorative manner is going to take me 500 hours. So that's how much more time I spend in it. But this is to give you an idea of what the coloration is uh, when I get done. And here's an actual picture of, of some out of a pattern book. And so that leads us into where do you start with a decoy? Well, you start with a pattern book, typically. Um, now, in the open class or professional class of carving at the waterfowl shows, all the open competitors are supposed to make their own patterns. They're supposed to actually, I, we go out and we take pictures of birds and you try to give them different angles and all this and then you come up with your own pattern. Um, but that's not true in all kinds of shows and it's not especially shoe, true for intermediate or beginning, but you'll have different poses and, and you can copy these and lay them on your rectangle of wood and trace around it. And typically you start out with a with the bandsaw. And with the bandsaw, you'll cut out one shape and then you'll cut out the other shape and you get rid of a whole lot of wood. All right? That's the way we start. Um, the second thing you do then or what I do, now I'm a power carver, generally. Sometimes I, when I'm working on this guy, I took a hatchet and draw knives and everything else to work a way to get it down close, to really work it fast. But I also use what I affectionately call the hog. This is a little air grinder, very inexpensive. You can buy them at Harbor Freight probably for less than 30 bucks. And you get a good carbide burr, uh, tip burr, and you hook it into your air supply. And when you turn this on, it makes tons of noise and even more dust. 
You know, you can really, um, some of the people have seen me do this before, but I can get this and just, you know, and just, uh, but that's a good way to get rid of a lot of the excess. I take it down to, to within a, an eighth to a quarter of an inch of where I'm going to finish up with this. That's what I, what I do first. Okay. Then I move to uh, my particular brand that I've had for 25 years plus is, is this one right here. And I sent it in for repairs for the first time, or for an overhaul, I should say, for the first time this last year. And they said, that's four models ago. That was our first model. I said, yeah, they're now plastic cased and all this kind of stuff. But uh, this little jewel, you can hear it. And then the neat thing about this is with this little cord here, you know, there's just no resistance to what you want to do. You tell it with your hand what to do, and there's no resistance here. So you can get much more accurate than if you try like these Fordham with the flex um, speedometer shaft cables, you know, those are, you, you try moving one way and its tendency is to bend the other way. And, but this is what I use for, for my detailed carving. When I get right down, hmm, just pop the leg off, um, for the real stuff. Now, where do we start and how do we start? A bird, any bird, and many mammals have the ability to change their outside shape by the way they contract their skin and move the muscles in their skin. And they can fluff out their feathers and look great, big, and fat, and lazy, and, or they can clench them down and look real tight and skinny. So you have to know anatomy, you have to know what is normal, and you have to know what type pose you're looking for when you figure all this in and make your pattern. But the one thing they can't change in any way, shape, or form is their mandibles. So the mandibles have to be exact. And you can buy study bills. Okay, you can get a study bill, which is a casting that they originally made off of a harvested bird. All right, w then how do you make it exactly the same shape? That's the first thing we, I'm going to show you. Let's say that your bill was roughly like this, all right? This is the head here. This is the lower jaw coming in here, all right? Now, what I do is I normally take on my study bill and I'll mark off like six or seven different spots about equal length, like that. Then what I'll do is I'll go get, a, I use old playing cards, and I'll take an old playing card, and the first thing I do is I cut, by trial and error, I cut out a shape here that matches this profile, that starts right here at the peak, and when you lay it on there, Look at there. You can't see light hardly in any spot through it. Just keep cutting with the scissors. If you cut away too much, make another one. Old playing cards are cheap. At the bottom, that's the bottom part of the thing, and I make that. All right, then I'll put, as you can see, I've got those little marks that corresponded to the spots. Then I'll start in, and number one was right about here. And I make one that goes perpendicular to the first one. Number two was back a little further. 
It was right here. All right. Number three. Kind of hard to see all of this stuff from back here. Um, but anyway, you keep you keep moving back until you get all the way back. And and what I do is I I will grind my little grooves until this fits down real nice, and then just kind of take it from one groove to the next, take it take it off, smooth it down. And the bottom of each one of these grooves tell me where the bottom of the upper mandible is supposed to be. Okay, now you can use this same technique in larger form for the body. You can do the same type of thing. Um, I keep, once I get a, a set of these made, I try to keep them because if I ever carve the white fronted goose again, it'll just save me some time. These are invaluable. I use these a lot. I've got some this size, which was convenient to bring, and I've got some that spread big areas that I've made out of just a couple of pieces of wood bolted together, and I spread them apart, and I'll get the length of it, you know, I'll say, and I'll get the, but this especially, when I'm using a pattern or something, I'll come in and I'll get the, the distance between the eyes, or I may get the distance from here, or I may, you know, just anytime you want to make sure that you're not way off, get something and measure it. And you can't really do it with a measuring tape. It's, it just doesn't work. It, the, the dividers are, are a very uh, helpful thing. This is the pattern that I made this was the top view, and this was the side view that I started out with when I bandsawed. I used some old wax paper, some stiff paper, and I lay, when I make the, the one, I'll, I'll put a piece of paper underneath it, and I'll take a, a compass or a um, square. And I'll lay it up against and I'll make a dot and I'll move it over a little bit and I'll make another dot around the sides like this. When I want to do the side view, I rotate the bird 90 degrees and, and clamp it up to a 90 degree block that I've made. And then I'll put the paper under it and I'll make this one. It's, you, you can see all the little teeny dashes that I've got in there. Well, those are dashes that I made when I took the, the square and went around. And, and that's how I make my, uh, my patterns. Okay, we've, once you get the, the bill to where it's as close to that study bill as you can get it, then it's time to do the rest. I rough shape, this is rough shaped. I haven't done any intricate work on it at all until this, except for this one insert. You can see the tail feathers I leave very thick until I've got everything else completely wood burned. Why? Because when I keep handling them like this, if they were so thin, I'd probably break them off a half a dozen different times, you know. And so I found it just easier to leave the whole tail until the very last thing and then carve it and detail it and move it in and out. It takes me about a third of the time, the total time to make a bird to get to this point. And I've got the right foot, which will go in here. It might take a little persuasion with some epoxy and some toothpicks to hold it in, and the left foot to go over here. I haven't made my band yet. I band all my birds. Why? Well, I'm one of the few people who carve who make full body birds. Most people make the 
flat bottom birds that just sit on tables. But I like to make them full body, uh, including the feet and stuff like that. And then where do you sign your work? Well, I decided a long time ago just to carve a band. And every one of mine, including the swan over there and everything else, I've carved a band out of wood. And I put it on there and then I sign the band. And then f during the judging, all I have to do is take a little piece of adhesive tape and carve up and cover up my name so that they can't, so the judges can't read the name. Um, that's the only thing you need to do to make it legal there. But uh, I haven't done that yet for, you can see I, I carved the little toe independently and insert it um, like so. But why? It's so much easier and quicker. And you don't, you know, I can just go at zoom, zoom, you know, with, with the rest of this and then drill a little hole and do that little toe and get all the detail I want in it and put it in there and there it goes. So actually in, a, in this carving, all of these feathers belong to this same body of wood. All of this, this wing, okay? This wing is an insert. All 10 primary feathers will go like that when I'm done. And you won't be able to see the seams when I get them done. Um, on the primaries, the birds groom their feathers and try to always keep them in good shape. Did you all know that the only feathers that make a bird fly are the primary wing feathers? On ducks, there's 10. On goose, there's 10. So they got 20 feathers that make them fly, and all the rest of the feathers are there just for uh, keeping the water off and keeping the wind from hitting their skin. That's all they're there for. They don't do anything to do, make them fly. Uh, the tail acts as a rudder. It helps them turn. But um, the only thing that propels them are these tin, tin feathers. So they keep these preened a whole lot more than they do the rest of their body. Preening means that they take their mandible and they pull on them. And what they're trying to do is, this is a, an actual feather. And a lot of times you get, you get, you get this, okay? Well, if you get this, I'll make it exaggerated, a lot of air is going to go through there and they're going to lose efficiency. And they'll take their bill and they'll go like that and look at there, it just goes right back together. So when they rest, a lot of times you'll, if you spend much time watching them, they'll be preening. And so I don't usually put a lot of splits this is called a split. Or I don't put a lot of overlaps. Sometimes I'll do that and put them up on top. I don't usually do that a lot on the primaries. I'll do it. This is a tertial feather from right in this area. And I'll do it on, on those. And I'll do it on the side pocket feathers down in this area. And that's all done during the detailing. The detailing. The splits I carve in with my little rotary thing. I'll take and use a um, stone, a white cylindrical stone, and I'll turn it on and I'll just very softly go like this and make a little split. And then you can paint. When you paint, you paint the feather underneath that split a darker color which really accentuates it and makes it look real. Um, you have a lot, all of these little indentations that you see on this uh, swan um, are, are the splits, the different splits. This thing I thought I'd never get done. To hold this in my lap and work on it, was one miserable task because you couldn't balance it. It's heavy. 
Um, it just wasn't fun. By the way, a decorative waterfowl carving competition is always done on water. We float these on water. And they have to float exactly right. They can't float too high or too low. They can't lean to one side or the other. They can't lean forward. They can't lean back. They have to look in a realistic pose. So before I put the legs in permanently, or the wings back here, or sometimes the neck up here, I will test float it, and I will go in with a drill, and I will make drills. If I need to take some weight out, I'll take weight out with a drill. If I need to add weight, I'll drill a hole and throw a whole bunch of lead shot in there and put some clay behind it and maybe a little epoxy and until I get it to where it's exactly floating the way I want it to. And that's the way I do that. <clears throat> now, back to the layout and the rough carving. I want to stress something that I find when I judge contests, I find all too frequently. And it upsets me because it's so easy to avoid. And that is, how many of you know of an animal that has a flat spot on its body? It, the bottom of an elephant's foot is not flat. There's no flats on any animal that I know, unless maybe you were talking about at a particular time, a fin of a fish. And I'm not sure there. But my point is this. When you carve, when you cut away with your bandsaw, the tendency of so many carvers are that they round it over, but they always leave a flat spot. They don't, they don't round it enough. They don't take enough away to make it look like. Do you see the side of this and see these little pockets of feathers, little groupings of feathers? You know, you, you, you carve those in there for a reason. That gives it some life. It makes it look real. But when you have a flat spot, and, and it only has to be a small flat spot. If it's perfectly flat, it just looks out of place. And if you're trying to do better in your shows, that's the place where you've got to eliminate. You've got to eliminate flat spots, OK? Um, like I said, some birds are, they look wider at times and narrower at times. This one's got this feather outside the side pocket feathers. So it's wider on this side than it is on this side. This side, it's going to have the, the side pocket. The, the side, you know, the feathers are all underneath this side pocket. They, when, when they get landed, if they don't do any preening, they'll take those side pocket feathers and they'll go like this and open up an area and they'll fold up their wing and put it back in and then put the side pocket feathers up over it. Keeps their wings waterproof. Waterproof. So that if they're on the water, they can take off and fly. They don't have wet, wet feathers. OK. Um, all right. Now the next thing that I want to talk to you about is wood burning. Wood burning, wood burning is a way that you put detail in the wood. I haven't got this all sanded. Some parts I've started sanding, but it's not sanded. But the wings I did sand, and I started wood burning some of it. OK? And the wood burning is not the color of the wood. 
It's to make the texture and the surface irregular in a pattern that you want it to be irregular. If you're carving a wolf, you want hairs, you want individual hairs. And if your size of carving demands hairs that long, don't wood burn them that long. And don't burn them three times deeper than you need to. And don't ever try to color, cover, or color, excuse me, color your wood with the wood burning. That's not the purpose of wood burning. Wood burning is there to make it easy to put little teeny grooves in. Now, if I pass this feather around, you'll see that in addition to the vein, okay, there's little teeny lines that come out in here that's, that actually have minuscule barbs that the reason why they stick together like that. What we're trying to do here is to give the eye the illusion that that's the same on our carving as what it is on a real bird. All right? So what a, do you think we need big coarse lines a sixteenth of an inch apart and a sixteenth inch deep? No. We need very fine lines, very shallow. And this is the same for songbirds or ducks or geese, any, any fowl, all right? It's the same with all of your furred animals. And the first thing you have to do is you have to know the anatomy of a bird enough to know which direction those lines need to go, okay? If you start on a bird, everything goes from its, if you assume that it was in a flying position and its head was straight out, all of the feathers are pointing from the mandibles back to the tip of the tail. So when it's in this position, the feather directions, now this is called the shaft of a feather. Every feather has them, although on the breast you don't see them because they're so small that you don't see the, the vein, the shaft, all right? But, but they start the direction of them, the direction that the feather flows. You, this feather wouldn't look very good like this. We're not making an Indian, okay? It looks like this. So the direction comes back, it goes down, it goes down this way, and it comes back this way, and then it comes back this way, and it comes back this way. That's the way the directions flow. So the first thing you have to understand is how those birds, and on the shoulders they go back like this, and they go back like this, and on the coverts, on the tails, they go down like this. You have to understand on a, on a coyote, or a wolf, or a dog, or whatever you're carving, you have to understand which way the hair goes. You don't, you, now, if you've got a dog like mine, it goes everywhere, and it's long and thin, and it's, but if you took a short, a short haired dog, like a, a lab, and you were carving a lab, and you put the lines perpendicular to the way they go, when you got done, you'd say, what's wrong? You got to get them the right way. Then when you get them the right way, you have to have the right shape to them.